Hello, I'm Kerwin of Father Sun Galaxy. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a segment that's called Star Wars in Our Community, where we spotlight people in the neighborhood uh, who are science fiction and fantasy fans. So what we have today is Jonathan Edwards, an accomplished health and physical education teacher in the Upper Marion School District. He has an impressive six-year tenure and a total of 13 years of experience as an educator. Recently, he attained a master's degree in exercise and sports psychology and aspires to publish research on internal and external imagery. Mr. Edwards is a multifaceted individual boasting a string of notable achievements. As a decorative athlete, he proudly holds gold, silver, and bronze medals from the prestigious 2019 Dragon Boat World Championships. Additionally, he has showcased his artistic talents as a published musical artist. Beyond his professional endeavors, Mr. Edwards finds solace in the realm of sci-fi, immersing himself in captivating narratives and embracing the boundless possibilities of imagination. And like anyone who appreciates life's simple pleasures, he enjoys indulging in delicious slices of cake, <laughs> which we will talk about later. Jonathan Edwards, welcome to Father Sun Galaxy. Hello, I had to laugh at that slice of cake. <laughs> True. Yeah, you didn't think they were ever going to bring that up in the bio, <laughs> but I, I can't wait to hear about it. You know, so I uh, want to start off by, you know, letting people know who are watching or are listening uh, later that uh, Keith is not feeling well today. So unfortunately, he's not here. So it's just going to be me. Uh, so it is a pleasure having you on. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, so what initially sparked your interest in health and physical education and what aspects of the field do you find the most rewarding? I think growing up, I was a really active kid. And as I got older and got my first job, I ended up working at youth sports camps. And that's kind of where the element of teaching came into play. And as I got further into high school and junior year where you're like, what am I doing with my life? Uh, I kind of said, you know, I've been teaching since I've uh, been a teenager and why not continue pursuing that? So that's what made me decide to go into the field of teaching health and physical education. And then when you're faced with a range of skill levels and abilities in your physical education classes, what strategies did you use to ensure inclusivity and participation? Um, I think it goes back to just having that ability to put yourself in the mind of a child and just saying, what would I like to do? How did I like to be treated? And how were my experiences growing up with kids who had all different ability levels? And just making sure that everyone works within their strengths and make sure people are also open to being in tuned to someone else's strengths and kind of using someone else's strengths to build someone up. So that's what I base my uh, classroom community is basically having everyone build each other in different facets of, of health and physical education. Hmm. And, and then what is your experience with the, the age range? You know, what, what are the ages of the children that you're uh, working with as far as physical education? Um, I'm at the elementary level, so, uh, elementary level. So kindergarten through fourth grade. So it's hmm. basically learning movement from its beginning stages to refining those movements as a fourth grader and eventually moving them on to the middle school level where they're going to be using those movements at a very exceptional level, high school and beyond. So it's lifelong skills that they're gonna be using and just helping them refine them and learn them. Now, is that your intention that you wanted to teach kids that age because you wanted them to learn the importance of physical education at an early age? Um, I think going into it, I was open to teaching all ages. And luckily for me, my first teaching job was at a school that had all ages. So I was able to learn how to teach the younger kids, such as kindergartners, elementary age, the middle school age kids, and as well as the high school age kids. So it was quite the challenge switching gears, so to speak. For instance, I would teach kindergarten first period, and then immediately after that have seniors in high school. So it was having that gear to switch and understand how to reach each different aspect of child development to get them engaged in the physical uh, activity. 
So it was kind of like, once I've understood that, I was open to teaching anything. And what are some of the innovative approaches or unique activities that you would uh, do with the kids um, to, um, you know, to get them active, to get them motivated? And have they been well received by your students? Yeah, I think finding what kids are into at this moment in time in terms of like pop culture and bringing that name from pop culture into the element of play. So naming someone or naming a game Star Wars versus Jedi, for instance, like or, or the or Jedi's versus Darth Vader, or something like that. Having kids be like, wait, what's this? And then having it into something that they're so uh, into is kind of like how I approach it. Now, how we know each other, uh, you are a physical ed teacher for my son, Maceo, in his elementary school. And I recall meeting you, not in person, but actually the first time I met you was during COVID. You know, we were, you know, at home. You know, we obviously, you know, had no other option but to have classes from home, virtual lessons. And that must have been different for you because, of course, you know, no one expected anything like a pandemic that would keep us all at home. But how are you able to continue to motivate your kids when you don't see them physically um, in the gym? Yeah, that was such an interesting time. And I think what benefited me, I think for myself, I, I think quickly on my feet. And what came to mind first when teaching virtually, I was like, this is kind of like television. So the first thing that came to my mind was, why don't I make this like a TV show? So what I did was, it was like almost like a Saturday Night Live type setup where I would introduce the topic of the day and I had a special musical guest. And that special musical guest was the music I played in the background as all the, the students entered from the waiting room into the virtual classroom. So it was more than just learning physical education virtually we added the arts and music element to it. So kids in fourth grade ended up knowing songs by Lionel Richie and Earth, Wind and Fire. So it was just kind of like a cool cross curricular thing in a TV type element, which made it fun for everyone. Parents in the background were like, is that Lionel Richie? Like, hmm. <laughs> it's pretty right. fun. Yeah. <laughs> and that's funny because, you know, you, you're a very young person and, you know, you must have heard this type of music uh, with your parents or, you know, older persons who were listening to Lionel Richie. You know, it, you know, I, I was just thinking about, it, you know, you said that you treat it like a TV show. And I was thinking back, you know, back in the 80s, we had Jane Fonda who had these workout videos. Right. So I wonder, yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering if maybe Jane Fonda might have been an inspiration for you, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, more Richard Simmons. Like I can vividly remember Simmons, yeah. popping in a Richard Simmons workout tape and I'm just behind her like, who's this curly haired guy in spandex? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it was it was a very interesting time, uh, but, you know, you had to continue to do your job and, you know, obviously you you exceeded expectations and, you know, it was, it was wonderful uh, watching the kids, you know, working from home, you know, doing the exercises that you're doing, you know, so it was uh, very inspirational. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk about your professional development. So um, what specific research findings or theories from your master's studies are you eager to integrate into your teaching of physical education? Well, I actually had students um, watch my thesis presentation. And I think for me, I had to learn how to break it down into simple words and simple theories that they could understand. So basically what my research was about different mental perspectives that you see things or imagine things in. So do you see or imagine things in first person from like a virtual reality type view in your, in your head, or do you see things from an external point of view, uh, like your whole body and how I, gave that to the students was imagine yourself, you know, cutting a piece of cake and the cake cutter is plastic. So you don't need adult supervision and it's the best piece of cake that you've had. And I brought them into that moment. And I said, just as you're about to bite that piece of cake, somebody sneezes on it. And there were so many reactions. One student was like, no, I can't believe it. 
And so the main overarching theory or um, narrative that I wanted to give them is that your mind couldn't tell the difference between what was actually happening or what wasn't because they were so connected to something that didn't even exist. So I wanted to tell them that their mind and their body have such a huge connection together. And then I asked them, well, does it make sense to spend more energy on things that make you sad or angry? Or does it make more sense to spend that energy on things that are fun and positive? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I want to spend time thinking about things that are positive. So just basically giving them that mind and the body are really connected and to spend more time on positive energy is what I wanted them to learn. Tell us more about your motivation behind pursuing the publication of your research. Um, well, I think that kind of tailors around to something that I recently got involved in six years ago, which is a sport called dragon boat racing. Uh, it's not very well known to people outside of the world, but once you get into the world, you're like, whoa, everybody's in it. Um, ah. Research basically looked at how paddlers use that type of imagery, and that was how I kind of got involved in it. I was able to be a part of the world championship uh, team in 2019 in Thailand, who ended up coming away with gold, silver, and bronze. And I thought to myself, you know, I was very in tune with my mind and body. Let's further explore how more of these high performance athletes use this type of imagery. And that's how I kind of started my research in that uh, field of dragon boat, which also has limited research to begin with. And I think that's what is kind of driving me to kind of put this uh, publication or start the process of getting this published to kind of add to the limited research that's really not available. Tell me more about dragon boat racing. I've never heard that term before. What is it? Where did it start? What's the history behind dragon boat racing? So it's has rich history from the Chinese culture. And the story behind it was back in like ancient times, there was a historical figure that was protesting something that was going on. And in protest, they threw themselves into the river and all the fishermen raced their boats to get to this high historical figure. And if you can imagine fishermen going back and forth, back and forth, racing to this person, and that's how the elements of Dragon Boat came into the picture. And in the 70s, it gained more international recognition. And then from there in the 80s, the first and oldest Dragon Boat team was created here in Philadelphia called the Philadelphia Dragon Boat Association. So it's the oldest Dragon Boat um, team in the United States, right in our backyard. And what it has is 20 people in a boat. You have 10 people on the right side, 10 mm -hmm. people on the left side. You have a drummer at the front of the boat that is facing everybody that's keeping cadence and keeping the rhythm, like pounding on the drum. And at the back, you have the steers person who's steering the boat during the race. And the beautiful part about the race is that all the boats are shaped like dragons. You have a dragon head at the front and you have the dragon tail at the back. And on June 3rd, I believe, the Independence Dragon Boat Regatta, it's one of the largest Philadelphia or one of the largest dragon boat races uh, in the United States is being held. So if there are people listening in the Philadelphia area, June 3rd, uh, all day is the Philadelphia Independence Dragon Boat Regatta. There's a lot of cultural history and it's fun for everybody. Hmm. And where is it taking place? On the Schuylkill River Boathouse Row. So oh, view, view, yeah. and a lot of history on that river as well. Wow. Okay. And you're going to be participating this year? I will, I will be helping. So I will be doing parking. So if you see me with parking, if anyone recognizes me through these videos, say hello. That's very cool. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I learned something. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, let's talk about your, your love for science fiction. I'd like to know when did it start? How did it start? Oh, man. I think... The movie that really got me into science fiction was Short Circuit with uh, the Oops. robot Johnny Five. Yeah. In fact, my iPhone is actually named Johnny Five um, because of that movie. And I'm like, whoa, this robot really has like the desire to learn. And I just found it so interesting that something without a heartbeat and something that just wasn't alive 
had this cognitive ability to tell everyone, no, I'm alive and just the adventures that happened. And then from there, as I got older, I saw Terminator. <laughs> Terminator 2 is by far my favorite movie of all time in science yeah. fiction. So, <laughs> yeah. Now that's interesting. Now I have not seen Short Circuit. I know of it. It came out in the late '80s, I believe. The only thing I know about the movie is the Elder Barge song. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell me a little bit more about Short Circuit. Um, so, Short Circuit was about this inventor who started creating these mini robotic figures. Uh, on the streets of New York and would just sell them for money. And eventually someone came into um, the scene. and was like, I like this robot. Can you build a bigger one? So they build a bigger form of these miniature robots. And just like any science fiction movie, something happens with electricity and gives this robot life. And the robot is just looking for what they call input, more things to learn about. So the ongoing phrase of the movie is, I need input. I need input. So the robot just ventures off and the inventors don't know where the robot goes. Robot goes into the library library in the city, reads about 50 books in a minute and starts learning all these things. And the inventor continues. I don't want to give away too much, but there's mm. short circuit and then short circuit too. So there's a sequel. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The first one must've been a hit. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Wow. I thought it was. <laughs> and then Terminator 2, I mean, two different movies. Yeah, but Terminator 2, I, 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 that I saw. Uh, yeah, that was so innovative in, as far as uh, uh, visual effects. Um, yeah. But not just that, it had a story um, yeah. and it was thrilling. Um, so what other movies inspired you? Oh, um, Back to the Future. Yeah. Back to the Future. One. Yeah, so even when I'm teaching... The, the kids if a student is kind of running late i'm like mcfly get in here and they're like who's mcfly and exactly. then I have to tell them about back to the future but i think back to the future one and two mm -hmm. are probably up there um three not so much but the first two back to the future movies are just something that if it's playing on tv i can put the remote down and regardless of what point in time the movie is at i can just sit back and watch it yeah well, I know you're also a Marvels fan because I remember one of the uh, the opportunities that I had watching you on virtually, you know, you were teaching the kids about, you know, different poses that Spider-Man makes. Is Spider-Man one of your favorite characters? Yeah, I think um, really if I'm thinking into Marvel characters, I'm a big fan of the X-Men side of Marvel and... Wolverine is up there with one of my favorite characters. Um, but if we're going like Spider-Man, I think Spider-Man would be second, then Iron Man. So Wolverine, mm -hmm. Spider-Man, Iron Man. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. Were you into comic books when you were younger or did you watch the TV series? Yes, so I was really into X-Men, the animated series, and also going the DC version, uh, Batman, the animated series, which I think was one of the best uh, animated series that I've probably seen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. What do you think of the, well, we're still waiting for, we've had the X-Men film back in, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, but you know, I'm expecting that at some point we're going to have a new X-Men uh, Wolverine is coming back. So uh, are you looking forward to seeing the X-Men return in the Marvel universe? Absolutely. 100%. I think there was like there was a time where I was looking up which metals could be stronger than Wolverine's animanium bones. <laughs> so I'm like definitely 1000 percent excited to see X-Men come back into the Marvel Universe. I loved yeah. how they were able to do the whole Avengers um, series of movies and tie all the other characters and all the individual movies into one and. I think they did it right how they ended it. And I'm, I'm glad to see that they're still continuing to do a lot more of the Marvel universe inside of Disney plus and with movies as well. Mm. And I also understand you're a star Wars fan. Yeah. I think my knowledge for star Wars is a little bit less than my enjoyment of the actual movies. Mm -hmm. So I'm not up there with some of my friends who can, 
bounce off names and I'm like, yes, I know who that is. Like I know the general names, but I enjoy the science fiction aspect and the overall story, but my knowledge doesn't go as deep as many, mm -hmm. but I am playing the new star Wars uh, video game right now, which is very fun. Is that Jedi survivor? Yes. Yeah. How is it? It is good. I did yeah. not have a chance to play the first one, but I was able to catch up through YouTube videos and through friends. Um, but the game is very fun to play. Um, I was playing a game that is also science fiction called No Man's Sky, which is essentially a huge sandbox games with like an infinite amount of algorithms, which would endlessly like allow you to play. There's no end to the game. And um, it just immerses into the whole space flying and planet discovery things. And it's really fun. So when it comes to these expansive universes, we have Marvel, Star Wars, you mentioned DC. Um, do you have a favorite? Uh, let me rephrase the question. So, when you, uh, so do you have, um, is there a world that, interest you if you were to inhabit one of these worlds if it was marvel or dc or science fiction what world would you to choose what opportunity would you choose to inhabit wow that's a very good question i i think the within like the science fiction the star wars the marvels the dcs i would have to go to the the superhuman power realm where people have different powers like i i like that because um even though they have a slight you know relationship to each other with like star wars and like the jedi and the force it's i think it's the the good versus evil and the force within star wars is just kind of one single thing but within like the marvel and the superheroes like everyone has different powers and i think that kind of helps me go back to teaching is that like everyone has different powers inside of uh performing and i you know i think that's where my connection is like everyone is different inside of pe and everyone is different inside of um marvel and superheroes and i think i enjoy both of them so I'm, i'll go with that the superhero experience yes do you, have you watched any, uh, have you seen Guardians of the Galaxy or watched any uh, any of the, the Marvel films? I have any not, ones? I haven't seen the newest Guardians of the Galaxy. That is on my list. Yeah. Um, I'm up to date with the Mandalorian, which I just finished last night. So I think the Mandalorian has been really fun for me uh, at this point in time. Although I feel the third se seasons didn't really match up to the first two but I still enjoyed it. Yeah. So that's that's very interesting that you brought up The Mandalorian because you're right, there has been controversy in regards to this season. Um, and I'm, I've been a Star Wars fan for, you know, all my life. And I understand the lore behind who The Mandalorians are, you know, the, 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 the their, their purpose, um, where they, the, where the origin of the dark saber com comes from now you are not probably um versed in the lore of star wars so you're really seeing it as uh, maybe a casual fan uh, you know not trying to categorize you but so i'm wondering when you're watching season three what was it that you felt they could have done better in storytelling <laughs> Yeah, I think that I did understand to a point some of the reasoning why the dark saber was so sought after, but I felt like in terms of um, the action and the story, it just it just lacked something. It was the type mm -hmm. of thing where I couldn't put my finger on it. In season one and two, you were just like, okay, what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I've kind of feel like this type of theme has happened. There was something that was put put them in a predicament and they have to get out of it. It was kind of like, okay, this is kind of repetitive or redundant. Uh, and I think that's what kind of made it kind of like lacking a little bit of luster for me. It was just like I could have predicted what was going to happen next, you know? Yeah, I, I was thinking... 
with season three that a lot of it, if you didn't understand who the Mandalorians were, their their culture, that you may have trouble understanding what's going on in most of the season because it was a lot. A lot of it was about you know their culture. It was about Bo Katan, who she is. Um, I don't know what you know about her backstory, but I was wondering if you know someone who doesn't know the history would they have trouble following what's going on i think that could have been part of the problem um with 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 season three but for me it was you know i enjoyed it uh, was it the the best of the three seasons no but I, at least i understood a little bit more about bo katan you know where she's from and where she's going uh well, for someone who may not know uh, who feels well? Do I have to go back and watch the Clone Wars episodes mm -hmm. with Bo Katan or watch the Rebels episodes? You know that that wasn't necessary. But you don't you didn't feel like you needed to know that. No, 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 no. History. Good. Okay. All right. Yeah, I felt yeah. like I understood the fact that the two groups of Mandalorians were just not as one at that point of time. Like, yeah. Bo Katan have her helmet on, and then eventually, like. She walks the way differently than we do, and we're now accepting that, which had a cool undertone to it uh, with, uh, like, the acceptance component, which was uh, pretty cool if you think about it. Yeah. All right. Well, you are a musician, right? Yes. Yeah. You play the guitar? What, what instruments do you play? I play the bass guitar. Bass guitar. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Four strings is a lot easier for me than six strings. <laughs> Got it. Okay. What is your musical inspiration? Why did you want to to learn music and who inspired you? Um, growing up, uh, I had a group of friends that lived on the same street as I, and one of them played guitar and another friend played guitar as well. And they're like, hey, you should ask for a bass for Christmas and then we can start a band and then we can find a drummer. And then for Christmas, I got a bass guitar and I knew a friend that uh, lived in a few neighborhoods over that played drums. And then from there, we just practiced and started a band. And in high school, we would play shows on Friday nights. We did it like a do-it-yourself type of thing where we saved up our money, recorded a, a CD. And then in our neighborhood, in our county where we grew up, it was a, a very large independent music scene so there were at least 50 bands where we were and one summer and uh after high school we did a east coast tour from pennsylvania all the way down to jacksonville florida and back up um and it would be sleeping inside of a car with four other people and uh staying in hotels and sharing the rooms with your friends and it was just a good experience as a young person to experience that um, in terms of musical interests that kind of um, inspire me, I, I do have like an old soul. I do kind of like the funk, the R&B type bass, like the old Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind and Fire, uh, the bars, like that's, that's my scene. And I think it comes from the respect factor that there wasn't a lot of technology that enhanced the recording in regard to singing and production that there is now. So the artists had to spend their times in that studio until they got it perfected. Whereas now, if you're kind of off in singing or on note, you can have technology kind of cut it and paste it and make it sound like it's perfect. So it's the respect back respect factor from back in the day that people put in countless time and energy to make it perfect. And I think that's where I kind of sit and 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 love in that era. Did you teach yourself to play the bass guitar? Yes. So oh, I cannot okay. read music. <laughs> so the music teacher is not happy with me because I told students that I could not re read music. And then their challenge to her was, well, if Mr. E can't read music and he was successful in mu as a musician, then I don't need to. <laughs> so, um, but I'm a very visual and auditory learner. So if I can see a movement of fingers, if someone's playing something and I could hear it, it's almost like seeing sounds. Like I could see where the next note should be. So it's, uh, that's, that's how I learn. Yeah. You're also a lyricist. Do you write your own music? 
I do not write the lyrics for my music, okay. um, but collectively we write the music together and then there is one person who writes the lyrics. Well, when you're um, collaborating with the music, composing the music, what themes or inspirations ignite your creative process? Um, I think what's cool about a band that doesn't really have a direction uh, of where they want to go musically, that they're just friends having fun, it allows for the creativity to kind of blend and make something unique. And if you're stuck in an air, not stuck, if you're in an area where you're just listening to something, that becomes a very influential. Um, if you're listening to something that is slow, you might want to integrate like some slow bass riffs into the into the band. But if you're listening to something that's heavier or fast, you might want to integrate that. So it's almost like what you're listening to in that point of time helps influence you uh, in the, the writing process. And can we find your music if we wanted to hear it? Yes, it's on mm -hmm. Spotify. Uh, my friends and I have a group called Cold Climate and it's a play on words. So it's the word cold, the word climb, like you're climbing a mountain and it, cold climb it. Gotcha, okay, wonderful, okay, all right. So as we said in the bio earlier, you have uh, a love of cake. <laughs> <laughs> now, if Keith was here, you know, he would tell you that he loves to bake cakes. You know, he just started learning not too long ago and he's very well. He does a uh, devil's food cake. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. With um, vanilla frosting. Wow. Sometimes he adds sprinkles to the frosting, but yeah, he loves making cake. Well, yeah. So, yeah. If he ever needs someone to be a taste tester that is outside of his family, <laughs> I would be glad to be that person. I am a baked goods connoisseur. Like I loved, I have a very large sweet tooth. Yeah. Well, that's hard to believe, you know, since you're a physical instructor, but that, you know, that's not to say that you can't indulge in <laughs> the finer things, you know, so that's pretty good. Do you have a, a, a particular type of sweets that you enjoy? Uh, I like, oh my gosh, that's a hard question. I like these cookies that I recently discovered. I don't want to advertise the, the place, but these cookies are filled with a certain type of high quality chocolate. And, uh, they're a chocolate chip cookie with a fancy chocolate epicenter and they consistently stay soft after you bake them. And I have found a different approach to baking these cookies. Instead of placing it in your standard oven, if you have an air fryer, I found that the air fryer cooks these cookies differently in a way where they're just enjoyable throughout the, the post baking process. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been baking cookies for a little bit. I, I don't use a fryer. I, I just bake it as normal. It's a mm -hmm. funny story because, um, I used to work, had a coworker whose younger brother would sell cookie dough. And every year, you know, during the holiday season, she would sell cookie dough for her brother and I would buy it. And then I just take it home, follow the instructions and just bake cookies. So I baked oatmeal raisin cookies and chocolate chip cookies. And I would bring them home. I was working in Hackensack, New Jersey at the time. And I would bring them home to Brooklyn where my, my family lives and they would, they love the cookies. Right. And then at some point, her brother graduated from school and, you know, like he had the nerve to graduate and, you know, she stopped selling the, the cookie dough. And I said, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> because I really love these cookies and my family are looking forward to these cookies every year during the holiday. So um, I was watching CBS Sunday morning, you know, doing a nerd thing, watching CBS Sunday morning. And I came across uh, an author who wrote a book, uh, recipes of all kinds of sweets and cakes. So she had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies and one for oatmeal raisin. And I've been baking these cookies, I don't know, at least 10 years now. And I, I love them. You know, I bake them for the family, uh, you know, for my immediate family. I, you know, I still take them over to Brooklyn and, you know, they, people love my cookies. I've taken them to work. So, uh, you know, I, yeah. So I just went ahead and just made it from scratch, you know. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and I still make them to this day. Well, you, yeah. you know the deal with me. Yes. <laughs> I'm always open to taste test. Very nice. Very nice. We would definitely. 
yeah, it's just, you just never know, you know, uh, we're working on, you know, I want to move up to making cinnamon rolls, you know, I haven't started that, but I think that'll be my next step because I love Cinnabon. I don't know if you're a fan yes. of Cinnabon, but I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to look into you know, learning how to bake Cinnabons yeah. and then maybe move on to muffins, you know, so it's, it's, I've, I've got a long list of, of, of baked goods that I want to start working on. That's so cool. I think yeah. there's kind of like an element. To, it's almost like therapeutic when you're when you're baking or you find something and you just like hyper focus on it. Like I know like when you're cooking or for me, like planting peppers and growing peppers, it's, there's just some sort of therapeutic element to it. That's just like, mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then do you have any favorite moments that you could share about food or um, sharing it with friends and family? Uh, yeah. So I I think it's very fun for me to introduce people to the food of my culture. Um, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, and certain dishes are very unfamiliar to people who are not from that uh, country. So it has a rich history of Indian culture and African culture in Trinidad. Um, and there is a dish called roti, which is basically uh, curry chicken, curry potato, whatever you want to add, chickpeas, seasoning and spice wrapped in a kind of like a tortilla in its own right to describe it um, and a flour dough. And it's just delicious. So when I introduce my friends to that, they're like, what is this and where do I get it? And I'm like, I can't tell you where I get it because I have to do that to myself. But it's something that I enjoy, yeah. introducing my friends to my culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was born in Barbados. Ah. Uh, so I, I know about the, the West Indian culture. Yes, yes. And I know about roti. Yes. Um, so we need to swap dishes, you know. Absolutely. You know, you bring some roti over here and you can share you can share our cookies and, and, and cakes with you. So that, that sounds wonderful. Please, please. It sounds like yeah. a wonderful time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's the, the usual uh, dishes, you know, the rice and, you know, what I grew up on, rice and peas and, yep. um, you know, salt fish. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, wonderful. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So this was, this has been very cool. This is wonderful to talk to you. It's a pleasure having you yeah. on the podcast. 1000%. And I think for yeah. both ends, there were so many things that we didn't know each about each other, even though we're so connected yeah. with, with your sons. Um, but thank you so much for having me. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I love talking sci-fi food and, and just talking and making connections. So yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure we have more conversations uh, uh, about, you know, our love for science fiction and food. So we're going to have to have you back. If oh, that's okay. uh, absolutely. 100%. Where can people find you? Are you on the socials? Uh, not so much on the social media. Okay. I'm more of a just sit back and watch. I'm not very active. But Got it. Pretty much on the Spotify for my uh, musical group, uh, which you've already asked about. Uh, that's that's pretty much the extent of my social media. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so th thank you, Jonathan Edwards um, from. Uh, the Upper Marion Middle School uh, physical education teacher. Just, this was wonderful. You know, so again, this is a part of our Star Wars, our community, and we just love talking to people in our neighborhood who are big fans of whether it's Star Wars, or even Star Trek, Marvel, DC, it doesn't matter. You know, we just love to just bring people on and just talk about, you know, our upbringing, you know, what we love to do. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who are looking to find out where we are, we are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Father Son Galaxy. Our website is fathersongalaxy.com. We also have a Patreon page. You could look for that as well. Um, check out any of our episodes if you that you uh, can see on YouTube and, and Instagram and Facebook once again. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. Take care and we will see you again.